Hello, everyone. Last week, we talked about the dining philosopher's problem in addition to uh, different concurrency mechanisms uh, in various operating systems, including Unix, Solaris, Windows, and even Android. And we have also covered some material on memory management with um, introduction to the basic requirements for memory management and of course, memory partitioning. For memory partitioning, we have talked about fixed partitioning versus dynamic partitioning and um, why do we need to partition the memory into fixed partitions? It could be either uh, fixed size, uh, or equal sizes or unequal sizes. And um, it's an old fashioned way to partition the memory to load the processes for execution uh, as compared to dynamic partitioning where each process will be assigned exactly the um, requested uh, block size. And it turns out that for fixed partitioning, uh, there is um, a lot of internal fragmentation that might um, be um, fragmented or happening into the mem main memory. And this is a major problem in memory management uh, versus external fragmentation, which has been caused by dynamic partitioning. And then we have seen that a solution to the dynamic partitioning problem like external fragmentation is by the use of convection. So um, in today's class, we will continue um, a discussion on different placement algorithms as a solution for the convection problem. Uh, in addition, we're gonna introduce a new uh, partitioning uh, algorithm is called the body system, which is a mix between fixed partitioning and dynamic partitioning. And then we will start talking about uh, sample paging and sample segmentation with the assumption that we are just dealing with the main memory and processes. There is no virtual memory uh, involved. So um, let's now start um, addressing the placement algorithms. Um, as you know that because memory convection is really time consuming process in which you have to shift all the processes to uh, fill in those external gaps between the processes in the main memory. Um, it's, it, it is a time pro um, consuming process. So the operating system designer must be clever enough in, in deciding how to assign those uh, processes to memory. In other words, how to block the holes. Uh, when it's time to load or even to swap a process into the main memory, and if there is more than one free block of main memory uh, in sufficient size, then the operating system must decide which free block to allocate. At this point, um, we have seen that a solution to this was a convection, but because it's, it's a time consuming, then three placement algorithms that might be considered to solve this problem. The first one is called best fit. The second one is called first fit. And the third one is next fit. Actually, there is a fourth one, which is the worst fit. Uh, of course, um, all of these placement algorithms are limited to choosing among free blocks of main memory that are either uh, equal uh, to or larger than um, the process to be uh, uh, brought in, in the main memory. So for the best fit um, algorithm, or uh, I always call the best fit approach to fit a block into the main memory, how it works is it, it chooses the block that is closest in size to the requested block. So um, as compared to the first fit, actually it, it, it does a little bit of overhead by uh, first scanning memory from the beginning of the memory and then and it chooses the first available block that is larger enough. This is the first fit approach. Finally, uh, the next fit approach, it also began to scan the memory from uh, the location of the lost placement. This is different. It doesn't scan from the beginning of the memory locations. It, uh, it scans from the location of the lost placement. So we have to monitor where the loss placement has occurred. And then this will be our start point to start allocating processes into the memory. Because after we allocate the loss placement, what we're gonna do next is we will choose the next available block that is also large enough. For the fourth one, which is the, first, the worst fit approach, 
it always allocate um, uh, each process to the largest partition. So if you are requesting 100 uh, kilobyte and then the largest partition is um, 1000 kilobyte, then it would go to 1000 kilobyte. So um, it might cause a lot of recommendation, but no, no processes, there is a chance that no processes will, will, will not be standby. However, it's not guaranteed. It's mainly based on the location and the memory and how many processes are arriving and the requested um, memory location. So in the following um, graph, what we can see here is an example um, of a memory configuration. So this is um, um, a memory configuration after a number of placement and swapping out operations have been performed such that the last block that was used was a 22 megabyte block from which, so we now have a 14 megabyte pro, um, uh, partition was created. So uh, you can see here that um, we have um, the starting um, address of the last allocation. This is after which we have a freed 14 megabyte. And we need to know the differences between the three placement algorithms and how they actually work. In satisfying a request by a process uh, that would need a size of 16 megabyte. Um, let's start now by, uh, by the best fit. The best fit will search the entire list of available blocks. So white blocks means it's available, while the gray areas means it is allocated, and the blue ones means it's possible new locations. For the best fit, as I said, it will search the entire list of available blocks. So we keep searching and make use of which block that is the best fit. We need, uh, we have 16 megabyte request. So the best fit here, let's discuss what the options. The option could be either uh, eight megabyte. These are, the, these are the free blocks or 12 megabyte or 22 or 18 or eight again and a six and 14 and 36 megabyte. 14 is not enough, we need 16. 22 is uh, a good option. Um, this is a good option and 12 is not enough. Eight is not enough and 18 is a good option. For the best fed, it would choose the one that is closed, closest enough to the requested block size such that the amount of um, fragments or like external fragments that will result uh, using the best fed algorithm is minimized. So if you're gonna choose between the 22 versus the 18 uh, free blocks, the best fit will choose the 18 megabyte um, block. And this will leave only two megabytes of uh, fragment. Uh, this is for the best fit. Uh, for the um, first fit, the first fed, how it works, it will start scanning from top to bottom and it will allocate the process to the first fed partition. So if we scan here the, from top to bottom, the first available partition is the 22. So for the first fed, it will assign the process uh, to the partition, the 22, and um, that will leave a gap of um, six megabyte. For the next FET, it will keep scanning after the last allocation. So the last allocation was um, from here. This is where the last allocation is. And the next FET will scan afterwards. It doesn't scan from the beginning of the memory. It scans after the last allocation. And then if you can, uh, if you see here, we have eight and a six and a 14 and a 36 available. So the first, um, the, the next fit partition uh, after the last allocation is the 36 um, megabyte, which is uh, a good fit to um, the 16 megabyte based on the next fit algorithm. So that will leave a gap of 20 megabyte. So this, the, the best fit left only a gap of two megabyte, while for the first fit, it left a gap of six megabyte, and for the next FED, it has a gap of 20 megabyte. 
So at this point, if we would like to choose which algorithm is best um, suited for the arrival process that would request at 16 megabyte, we would choose the best fit. But this choice is not always the optimum because it depends on the flow of processes. If we have more than one process, then we will have more than one fragments and the decision will be based on the size of the entire fragments. In addition to if we have multiple processes that will be blocked waiting for um, memory to be freed. That means uh, deciding on which of these approaches um, is the best option will actually depend on the exact sequence of uh, processes arrival and swapping, in addition to the sizes of the requesting processes. The first fit algorithm is not only the simplest, but usually the best and the fastest as well. Um, the next fit algorithm tends to produce slightly worse result than the first fit. The next fit algorithm uh, will more frequently lead to an allocation from a free block at the end of the memory. The result is that the largest block of free memory, which usually appears at the end of the memory space, is quickly broken. Is quickly broken up into small fragments. At this point, convection may be required more frequently with the next FET. On the other hand, the first FET algorithm may lighter the front with small free partitions that would need to be searched over on each subsequent uh, first FET pass. The best FET algorithm, despite its name, is usually the worst performance. That's why I said it's not the case that the best FET will be the best all the time. Sometimes we might have worst case scenario with using the best FET algorithm. This is mainly because this algorithm looks for the smallest block that will satisfy the requirement. It guarantees that the fragment left behind is as small as possible. But although each memory request always wastes the smallest amount of memory, the result is that the main memory is quickly uh, lettered by blocks too small to satisfy further memory location allocation requests. At this point, the memory convection must be done very like more frequently than with the other algorithms. So you can see here different variations of placement algorithms that are uh, widely used as a solution of um, the overhead of the convection. So maybe by using the best fit or the worst fit, or even the first fit and the, the next fit, uh, the amount of convection will be minimized. But again, they are, suggest they are being su suggested to solve the convection problem. But in some scenarios, we might even do more convection because of these algorithms. So they are alternative solutions, but we still might have some convection procedure performed. Let's look to the following example and um, see the differences between each of those algorithms. And um, at the end, we need to choose which best algorithm we need to choose. So if we um, look here, we do have um, five memory partitions. The first one is of size 100 kilobyte. The second one is 500 kilobyte. The third one is 200 kilobyte, and then six, 300 kilobyte, 600 kilobyte in order. Uh, at the same time, we do have um, uh, four processes, uh, like uh, four processes for arriving processes. The first one is requesting size of 202 kilobyte. The second one, I'm going to call this process one. And then 417, this is process two. And then 112, this is process three. And then 426, this is process four. They are also arriving in order. And then what we actually need to do is we need to try the three uh, different uh, placement algorithms. Uh, at this point, the placement algorithms would be um, the first fit, and then versus the best fit. And actually, now we added the worst fit. So you could add the next fit and see uh, also compared with the other techniques. But in this example, I will focus on the first fit versus the best fit and the worst fit. Let's now compare, um, do the allocation using those um, um, three placement algorithms and see um, the memory allocation based on each one, uh, one of those algorithms. And 
uh, do the comparison between them and make a decision which one is best suited for um, those um, processes. Um, so now let's see uh, how we're going to perform each of those algorithms uh, separately. So I will do the first FET versus the best FET and then the worst FET. Don't forget that we have memory partitions as the first one is 100 kilobyte and then 500 kilobyte and then 200 kilobyte and followed by 300 kilobyte and finally 600 kilobyte. So um, also don't forget the flow of the processes, process one, request 212, like 212 kilobyte, and process two requests 417 um, kilobyte, process three requests 112 kilobyte, and process four requests 456 kilobyte. Just to be sure that I have the right numbers. Yes, that's correct. Amazing. So now let's see uh, how the first fit would work if we would like to um, to um, uh, allocate those uh, four processes. So the first process that is arriving is 212. And for the first FET, it will scan the memory from the beginning until it find the partition that is um, well suited or like large enough to fit the 212. As you can see, that would be the 500 partition. So if I'm going to call this, let's name them partition one, partition two, I'm going to just call them partition three for e easy uh, allocation, and then partition four, partition five. So with the first FET, with the 212, it would be allocated uh, at the beginning uh, spot over here. So um, that will leave a big gap in the uh, 500 block, which is 288 kilobyte of gap. So um, now for the second uh, process that is arriving, which is 417, for the 417, uh, so this is, I'm going to say this is process one, two, one, two. And for the war 417, it will keep scanning from the uh, beginning until the end of the memory, looking for um, the large enough um, um, partition to be allocated to this process. And actually, it is the 600 block. So this is the 417. And that will leave a gap of 183 um, kilobyte. So this is the second gap. And then um, with the arrival, so this process is done. Now this process is done again with the arrival of 112 for uh, process three that requests uh, 112 um, kilobyte. If we keep scanning from the beginning of the memory uh, until the end, looking for the first FET. As a matter of fact, we do have a nice partition of size 288 that is this FET to the 112. So the 112 will be allocated immediately after the 212, and that will give a will leave a gap of 116. So we don't have this gap anymore. Now we have a new gap of 116 um, kilobyte. So now process three has been allocated. And that means um, we still have the 100 mega partition one free. We have 116 uh, kilobyte free. We have the 200, which is partition three free. The 300 is free and the 400, uh, sorry, and in the partition five, we have 183 kilobyte of available locations. And uh, with the arrival of process four right now, that would request a memory of size 456. Uh, actually, there is no available block that can fit the size. That means process four must wait. So for process four, um, it has to wait because there is no available member location that can be used um, or, uh, enough to allocate such a process. So first FET 
has the following memory of partition um, and allocation. And uh, we know the process for mass weight. Let's now try the best fit. For the best fit, uh, it will keep looking for the best fit partition that will minimize um, big holes, but it will still have lots of small holes. So let's do again, process one is arriving that is requesting 212 and the best fit would uh, over here will be the 300 block. So this is where process one will be assigned. So um, for the 212, uh, that will leave a gap of 88 um, um, kilobyte of um, fragments in the partition of the 300. So this is uh, where we can see uh, partition gaps over here. And um, now for process two, process two is requesting uh, 417. And for the 417, um, if we keep scanning, looking for the best fit that will fit the 500, um, sorry, the um, 417, that would be the 500 block. So process two will be assigned over here and that will, um, um, will be assigned of size 417 and that will leave a gap of 83 kilobyte in this partition, which is like considered as a new partition. If we have a new process that would need 83, that would be a good fit. And now for the 112, which is a request by process three, look into the press fit. We have 100, we have 83, uh, none of these are enough. We have the 200, so this is good. And we have the 600 or the 88, 88 is not enough. So that means the only two options available now will be the 200 kilobyte and the 600 kilobyte. So if we do, uh, if we looking for the best fit, then, um, that would be the 200 block. So assigning the 112 to the 200 block, this is process three, will leave another 88 of uh, um, fragments or another partition of size 88 that could be suited for another process uh, of 88 kilobyte or less. And finally, um, for the four, uh, for, for process four, so for process four that requests um, uh, 456, actually we still have the 600 plug that was not used. So that would be a good fit for process four and that will leave another uh, partition of size 174. So as you can see here, process uh, all the processes have been assigned to memory and we still have uh, enough partition of 100 and then 83, 88, uh, 88 kilobyte and 174 kilobyte available. But all the processes have been uh, allocated to the main memory. Now we are not wasting the processor time. Now, if you look to the third algorithm, which is the worst, the worst FET, the worst FET allocates processes to the largest partition. Uh, this is really bad. Sometimes it's preferable based on the sequence of processes and the requirement and priority of processes. Uh, but um, in most of the cases, it's the worst FET um, scenario. So for process one, it needs 212 kilobyte. And if we look to the largest, largest partition to be available, that would be the 600 partition. So it would go immediately to the 600. It will reside in 12, um, two kilobyte. And that will leave 388 kilobyte gap of fragments. For process two, it requests 417. So the largest partition that will fit would be the 500 partition. So this is the 417, this is process one, and this is process two. And then we'll leave a gap of um, 83 kilobyte over here. And for process three, process three, it requests 112, like 112. So um, for um, Process three, it needs only 112 and it looks for the largest partition, the largest partition that we have so far, uh, or the partitions that we have so far is 183, 200, 300, and 388. So choosing the largest one among these would be the 388. So actually process three would be assigned to this partition and that will leave uh, 200 another. So this, we don't have this anymore, it would be 276 kilobyte after the location of process three that requests 112. Now for process four, process four would require 456. There is no more available for uh, um, uh, partitions. 
three partitions that can be assigned to uh, process four. So the solution with the fourth fit would be that process four must wait. So if you look here in monitoring the amount of fragments uh, that has been caused in addition to the location of the procedures, if my priority that all the procedures should be assigned, I would go for uh, the best fit. If my priority is um, uh, I need to minimize the amount of gaps that are left, though at this option you might go for uh, process, um, worst fit or even the first fit. But if I would combine the two strategies, I think the best fit at this point is, is good. Like we have um, small gaps um, the equally distributed among partitions. So create more partitions. It's still small sizes that would need a lot of compaction, but most of the processes have been allocated to the memory. So I will choose at this point the best fit. If my criteria is to allocate most of the processes and, and leave small fragments. So the following slide actually um, um, highlights on um, what happens with the first fed versus the best fed and even the worst fed, which uh, where the procedures have been allocated. And um, the choice at this point would be uh, the best fed, which turns to be actually the best option for those arriving procedures. So um, with this, um, we know that um, both, um, both actually fix it and dynamic uh, partitioning schemes have drawbacks. Uh, a fixed partitioning scheme limits the number of active procedures and may use uh, space inefficiently. This is in particular if there is a poor match between available partition sizes and process sizes. Uh, on the other hand, a dynamic partitioning scheme is more complex to maintain and it includes the overhead of compaction. An interesting compromise to the two methods um, would be the body system. The body system is a comprisation uh, approach that actually combine fixed and dynamic partitioning scheme such that the space allocation, um, the space available for allocation is always treated as a single block. Uh, so we divide the memory into blocks or we divide the memory into bodies such that each memory block is of size two to the power k words where k is a number between l and u, l is the lower bound and u is the upper bound, 2 to the power l is considered as the smallest size block that is allocated, and 2 to the power u is the largest size block that is allocated. Generally, 2 to the power of u, where u is the upper bound, is the size of the entire memory available for allocation. So the body system is very efficient uh, as compared to the fixed partitioning and dynamic partitioning. It consider that um, all of the memory blocks are, are of size uh, power of two, like two to the power one, two to the power two, two to the power three. And um, memory uh, allocations to processes depends on which one is best suited to each body or each partition. Uh, which is which is a comparison to how close it, this number is to two to the power of k, where k could be a number between an l and u. To illustrate this idea, actually, uh, and to begin, the entire space available for location will be considered as a single block. So we consider my memory as just a single block or just single body, and this is of size. So the entire size of this uh, will be. Uh, two to the power of u, where u is the largest, um, the upper bound. And then if there is a request, I assume we have a request s, uh, such that uh, is, is um, between two to the power u minus one and two to the power u. So it's easy uh, made decision where the block will be entirely allocated. Otherwise, if it's not big enough, then I, I, if it's a small enough, like close to another two to the power of u minus two or two to the power u um, divided by two, at this point, it goes into a splitting criteria. So the block will be divided, it will be splitted into two equal bodies. Each one of them will be of uh, size two to the power u minus one. And then we consider at this point, if two to the power of u minus two 
um, if the size of the allocated block is between two to the power u of minus two and two to the power u of minus one, then the request is allocated to one of those bodies. Normally, we allocate to the ones on the left-hand side or the right-hand side based on the available allocation, but we always allocate to the left. Otherwise, one of the bodies is also split. So we split, we're gonna split this one more, or we're gonna split this one more. And if we can fit in one of these bodies, that would be good. If not, we keep splitting. So we keep splitting until we find a good partition that can be a best fit to the requested um, memory allocation. And keep in mind that um, each, um, each body is a power of two make, would make the allocation of processes into the main memory uh, more uh, efficient. So um, whenever we have a pair of bodies on the, uh, um, that are contiguous, like con continuous, like we have two pair of bodies that are continuous, when we remove some of the, uh, the processes from those bodies, like assume I do have process one here and this one is free, now we remove process one, so this one has become free as well. So these two would be combined into an, a body that is uh, of the um, double size of these two. Uh, that means we have removed the whole caused by process one, and now we have a bigger partition available for further allocation. To actually understand this, let's go over the following example. So uh, in this figure, we can see an example of using one megabyte um, as an initial block. And so we do have one body. We consider like the entire memory. So this is my memory of one megabyte is one body. And then we look to the request, the sequence of requests uh, arriving from processes and see which um, body will be actually assigned to each process. Um, based on splitting the memory uh, iteratively until we find a good body to be allocated to each process. So assume we start by process A that requests uh, 100 kilobyte. So if we compare here, 100 is way less than the 100 megabyte. So now I need to split this 100 megabyte into two partitions. The first one is of size 512 and the second one is another 512. So we compare the requested 100 is still way low as compared to the 512. So I need to divide this to split the 512 into more, into two other bodies. Each one of them is for 256. This one is 256. So 256 is way more as compared to the 100. So we have to split again. We keep splitting from the left, as I said. So now I'm gonna, I don't need to split um, this 256. I'm gonna split from my left. So the other 256 here would be split into two bodies. Each one of them is of size 128. Now the 100 request can be easily allocated to the 128 of the left. This is process A. Now we have a request made by process B that would need 240. If we keep scanning at this point, I have 512, I have 256, I have 128 and uh, this is uh, occupied. So among the three bodies available, um, I do have 256 close enough. As, remember, we are looking to the best fit body that is close enough to fit the size of the requested process. So that means process two will be easily assigned to the 256 and I don't need to do any splitting at this point. On the other hand, we received, so this is, I'm gonna say this is A and a B and then and a C. We received a request from process C that would need 64 kilobyte. So we keep scanning the body system that we have. We still have the 512. This is way large. This is not a good, a best fit to the requested 64. I only have uh, 128. So we have the 512 and 128. So now I can easily split the 128 into two bodies where I will fit process C into the 64 partition from the left. Now we receive a request of 256 for process D. Uh, if we keep scanning the only available blocks right now, bodies, available bodies would be the 512 and the 64. 64 will not fit. So the 512 is way larger as compared to the 256 as um, we compare to two to the power of K as a word. So at this point, we will divide the 512 into two bodies. Each one is of size 256. And that means process D will be assigned to um, the uh, 256 from the left. 
Now, if the operating system would do well, uh, like the processor now has completed process B and then we'd like to release process B from the main memory. So B will free another 256. And we cannot combine the 256 with 64 because uh, we remember we always splitting um, by halves. So now we cannot combine these gaps. But if we're going to release A, that's 156 for partitions. So now we have another 128. We have a 64. We have a 256. And we have another 256 free. If we have a new request made by a process, all of these are just assumptions for the example, 75K for process um, um, E. So we scan from the left to the right. The first available pod that is best fed to the 75K will be the first block. So E will reside in this partition or this body. Now, if the operating system has decided that C has been completed and it's time to release it. So when we release C, we're gonna release this 64 and this 64 is already free. So we could easily combine them because they are in the same um, uh, half split uh, or we will say um, neighbor bodies. So we could combine them to a big partition of 128 or a big body of size 128. Now, if we release E, e afterwards, so E will uh, free another 128. So 128 would be combined with the neighbor body, which is uh, 256. 256 with another 256 will give me a big, a big body of size 5112. Now, if we decided to relieve D, now my entire memory is one body again. So this example actually shows a sequence of allocations um, to um, different processes. Uh, the first uh, step is by dividing um, the, the main memory into two bodies and then um, keep dividing those bodies until we find the best fit to the assigned process. Keep in mind that when we release a process or we, we remove a process from the main memory, if we have two neighbor bodies, they should be combined into um, uh, one big body. And the process continue with the splitting and merging, splitting and merging as needed. And um, this is really um, um, a good strategy as compared to um, the placement algorithms. Uh, at some point, uh, the amount of compaction that is needed is minimized. In addition to, um, we consider because at the end, uh, each memory location is a word, a word is a, a power of two. So somehow we find a good um, or like a best fit of allocating processes using um, the body system. In addition to the following figure, there are uh, um, different um, representations of the body system using uh, a binary tree representation. Um, uh, it, you could draw this binary tree after the entire uh, precise allocation, or you could draw it after each allocation. So if, um, if we look here to the body, uh, the body system of allocating processes to memory, immediately after, I'm going to assume this is just for after the uh, release request. So B now is released. If you look, if you compare this to the previous graph, you will see that um, we, uh, the B has been released and we are left with a block of 64 uh, as leaf node. So all the leaf nodes at the end would be of two types. The first one is leaf node for allocated block, leaf node for unallocated block, and non-leaf nodes. Non-leaf nodes means it would be further split. It. Uh, so for the um, 512, it was it split into 256 and then 256. The 256 was assigned, so now it has, um, that's why it's a leaf node for allocated block. Uh, we have another 256 uh, from the other 512 that is freed, like there is no location yet. While for the left 256, it was split into 128, 128. The 128 is um, not a leaf node. Now it's further divided into two partition. One of them is 64 that is free and the other one is 64 that is occupied. And then the 128 is fully occupied. So you can see, I'm gonna use the X for occupied and um, the check mark for unoccupied. And then um, the dashed node means it is not a leaf node. So this is a binary tree representation that we normally use it to represent the body system at a certain scenario, like, or we stop, uh, like here my stopping criteria just after the release of B. 
uh, we consider the leaf nodes um, as the current partitioning of the memory. Uh, if two bodies are leaf nodes, then at least one must be allocated. Otherwise, they would be um, merged into a larger block. The body system in general is a reasonable compromise to overcome the disadvantages of both uh, fixed and variable partitioning scheme. In, um, in modern operating system, virtual memory based on batching and segmentation is superior. So they don't use body system a lot, especially in modern operating system. However, the body system has found application in parallel systems and it's, it is considered as an efficient means of allocation and release for parallel programs. Uh, also, a modified form of the body system is generally used for Unix kernel memory allocation. So, um, as we talked about different memory allocation, um, uh, it also um, comes uh, the notion of relocation. Before we consider ways of dealing with the shortcomings of partitioning, we must actually clear up um, one loose end, which is uh, related to the placement of processes in memory. When the fixed partition scheme is used, we can expect a process will always be assigned to the same partition. Um, that is like whichever partition is selected when a new process is loaded will always be used to swap that process back into memory after it had been swapped out. In that case, a simple relocating loader can be used uh, when the process is first loaded. Uh, memory, uh, all um, relative memory locations or references in the code are replaced by absolute main memory addresses. Um, which is actually determined by the base address of the loaded process. In addition to this, uh, in the case of equal size partitions, and in the case of a single process queue for unequal size partitions, a process may occupy different partitions during the course of its life. When a process image is first uh, uh, created, uh, it is loaded into some partition in main memory. Later, the process may be swapped out when it's subsequently swapped back in. It may be assigned to a different partition than the last time. Uh, this is also true for dynamic partitioning. Furthermore, when convection is used, processes are shifted while they are in the main memory. Uh, thus, the locations or even the instructions in data referenced by, by a process are not fixed now. They will change each time a process is swapped in or shifted. To solve this problem, a distinction is made among several types of addresses. So to dis differentiate between those types of addresses, we define the logical address versus the relative address and the absolute address. A logical address is considered as a reference to a memory location independent of the current assignment of data to memory. And at this point, a translation must be made to a physical address before the memory access can be achieved. On the other hand, the relative address is a particular example of the logical address in which the address is expressed as a location relative to some known point usually a value in a process register. Finally, the physical or we call it absolute address is the actual location in the main memory. So programs that employ relative addresses in memory are loaded using dynamic runtime loading. Typically, all of the memory references in the loaded process are relative to the origin of the program. That means a hardware mechanism is needed for translating relative addresses to physical main memory addresses at the time of execution of the instruction that contains the memory reference. In this figure, we can see uh, the way in which this address translation is typically achieved. So when a process is assigned to the running state, a special process register, sometimes is called the base register, is loaded with the starting address in the main uh, memory of the program. There is also a bound register 
that indicates the ending location of the program. These values must be set when the program is loaded into memory or when the process image is swapped in. During the course of execution of the process, relative addresses are encountered. We don't have absolute addresses when processes are uh, executing. We're always looking for relative addresses, but we, uh, we must map or translate those relative addresses into absolute address to actually looking for the physical address in the main memory uh, that will execute the instructions. Um, the relative addresses um, that are encountered in uh, during the execution of processes would actually include um, information related to the content of the instruction register, uh, instruction addresses, uh, which contain the instruction addresses that occur in branch and colon instructions, and even data addresses that occur in load and store instruction. Each such relative address uh, go through two steps of manipulation by the processor. First, the value of the base address, the, the value in the base register is added to the relative uh, address in um, the process program, prog uh, the, the process uh, code. And uh, adding the relative address to the value in the base register using an adder will generate absolute address in the main memory. Second stage, the resulting address is compared to a value in the bound register. So we do a comparison between a value and the bound register. If the address is within the bounds, then, then the instruction execution may proceed. Otherwise, an interrupt is generated to the operating system, which must respond to the error in some fashion. Uh, if we, uh, the following graph actually allows programs to be swapped in and out of memory. Uh, during the course of execution, it also provides a measure of protection. Each process image is isolated by the contents of the base and the bound registers, and it, they are safe from unwanted access by other processes. So when it comes to process allocations into the main memory, swapping processes in and out, executing processes will always be related to relative addresses. Uh, but when it comes to allocation into the main memory for, um, uh, for actual execution, those relative addresses will need to be translated to absolute or physical address, then uh, um, an address translation scheme is required. So um, both um, unequal fixed size and variable size partitions are inefficient in the use of memory. Uh, the former one, like for fixed size, uh, unequal, unequal fixed size partition, will result in internal fragmentations. And um, variable size partition will result in external fragmentations. And actually, if you assume that, um, however, the main memory is partitioned into equal fixed size chunks that are relatively small, and that each process, on the other hand, is divided into fixed size chunks of equal uh, or the same size, we will call those chunks pages. So pages are ch small chunks of a process and frames are small chunks in the memory. Then the chunks of a process could be assigned to available chunks of the main memory. So we assign a uh, pages to frames. Um, we uh, we will show in the following slides that uh, the wasted space in memory for each process um, is due to internal fragmentation, consists of only a fraction of the last page of a process. There is no external fragmentation at all. That's why paging is used. So paging uh, is a way of memory management. In addition, we have talked about memory, uh, we have talked about partitioning, we have seen fixed uh, size, uh, unfixed size. We talked about dynamic partitioning, we have seen internal fragmentation, uh, external fragmentation, convection, different placement algorithms. And we have e even seen the, bit, um, the body system, which is still considered as a way of memory allocation using the partitioning um, methodology. Baiting, on the other hand, will uh, uh, deals with different perspective by dividing a process uh, before um, uh, allocation into the main memory into small chunks. And the memory is already divided into small chunks like frames. So the memory is divided and the process is divided 
in partitioning, we were only dividing the memory into partitions while we are not touching the process at all. In paging, no, we are dividing the process into small fixed size chunks of the same size. And the memory is divided into equal fixed size chunks that are also relatively small. The page size could be the same as a frame size or the page size could be multiple frames. It depends on the assignment or um, the size of the page and the size of the frame. So in the following figure, um, we can see the use of pages and frames. At a given point in time, some of the frames in memory are in use and some are free. Um, a, a list of three frames is always maintained by the operating system. Uh, we can see here that process A, so um, we initially um, have 15 available frames. So the memory is divided into 15 frames. The frame size is very, like it, it's user, it's an operating system actual decision. So the operating system would decide what is um, the size of the frame. It should be small enough. So it accommodate, um, um, I, it would be easy to, to um, allocate a process over multiple frames. Um, the operating system, as I said, always maintain uh, a list of free frames. So it keeps track of those free frames to help processes to be allocated over multiple frames. They could be on sequence or they could be um, distributed across the entire memory. So um, uh, assume now process A is arriving and um, process A um, um, it, uh, consists of four pages. And we assume that when it's, uh, it's time to load this process, the operating system was able to find four free frames and loaded the four pages of process A into the four frames. That means at this point, we assume that the page for this example, the page size is the same as the frame size. This is the best practice, but it could be different like based on the operating system decision. So now we can see that the operating system has decided that we have the entire memory is free. I will allocate process A into the first available, available uh, four frames. Now um, process B is arriving and uh, it, is, um, <clears throat> it consists of three pages. Uh, and then process C would, uh, is also consist of four pages. The operating system might decided to put uh, process uh, B in frame four and five and six and process C in frame seven and eight and nine and 10. All of these are decisions by the operating system. So now uh, I'm gonna assume that um, that's an assumption for the, this example that the uh, process B is suspended and now it's swapped out of the main memory. So now these, um, these frames are freed. And later, um, if we assume that um, uh, all the processes in the main memory are blocked, so um, waiting for some event, then the operating system would decide to bring in a new process, assume this process is D and it consists of five pages. So if the operating system would decide to allocate them in sequence, I don't have five sequence frames in a row. So the operating system has to decide to distribute the five pages over five frames, not necessarily to be in sequence. So uh, that means uh, we have to keep track of uh, pages, uh, like which page is allocated to which frame, because now we are not assuming that they are in sequence, that they are distributed. So we need somehow kind of translation between the um, relative, the logical address of a process versus the physical address in the main memory, which means which page of the process will be mapped later to which frame in the main memory. So um, as you can see here in this example, there are no sufficient unused uh, content, um, um, like, uh, uh, like in sequence frames to hold the process. Um, this, uh, you, you might ask yourself, you might say, uh, this would prevent the operating system from loading the process D and the answer for this is no, the operating system can actually allocate uh, processes across different frames, as I said, across distributed across the memory, but using the notion of logical address. So um, if we would like to map logical addresses into physical addresses, excuse me, a simple uh, base address register 
will, not, will, will no longer be um, sufficient. Rather than the operating system will maintain a page table for each process. The page table uh, shows the frame location for each page uh, of the process. And as a matter of fact, within the program, each logical address would consist of a page number and an offset within the page. Um, recall that in the case of simple partition, a logical address is the location of a word relative to the beginning of the program. The processor will translate this relative address into physical address. The, uh, the usage of paging allows a translation between logical to physical address translation, uh, which keep in mind is done by the processor hardware. That means the processor must know how to access the page table of the current process. And um, with, the, with the logical address, which is uh, a composition of a page number and offset, the processor would use the page table to produce a physical address, which is a frame number and an offset. Let's see how this address translation is done by maintaining the page table and allowing um, logical addresses within a process to be translated to a physical address within the main memory by incorporating the page table um, data structure. Let me show you how the operating system used the page table and um, um, the free um, frames for allocation as well. And then we go over the address translation. Continuing our example, the five pages of process D are now loaded to a frame uh, four and a five and a six and 11 and 12. They are not in sequence. And um, uh, process A uh, reside in a zero, one, two, three frames. Process B is swapped out of memory. Process C is in a seven and eight and nine and 10. And the list of three frames are 13 and 14, which are uh, traced back by the operating system to decide which frames are available for future processes. A page table contain at this point for each uh, one entry for each page of a process. And um, the, the table is easily indexed by the page number starting by page uh, number zero. So this is page zero. This is we have page table for each process, page one, page two and page three in sequence. Each table entry contains the number of the frames in the main memory, if any, that will hold the corresponding page. In addition to this, the operating system maintains a single free frame list, uh, which contains all the frames in the main memory that are currently unoccupied and actually available for new pages. As you can see here, that simple paging as we describe it in this fashion is similar to fixed partitioning. However, the difference is, is that with paging, the partitions are rather small and the process is briary divided into pages, which means that there is a, a good chance that a program may occupy more than one partition and these partitions should be um, small and not necessarily to be in sequence. Now let's see how the operating system actual uh, uh, perform paging scheme using the logical to physical address translation. If you recall in partitioning, we were dealing with the relative addresses in which uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, a relative address uh, within the entire main memory. There is no um, partition and uh, there is no paging or nothing. We just uh, were talking about relative address uh, within a reference uh, of the main memory directly. Uh, uh, relative address um, relative to the starting address in the main memory. So uh, to make paging uh, scheme convenient, let's actually um, decide on the page size first. And um, we assume here uh, that it is exactly the same as the frame size, which is a power of two. Uh, with the use of page size that is a power of two, uh, it is uh, easy to demonstrate that the relative address, which is defined as a reference to the, uh, um, the starting address in the main member of a program, uh, the logical address can also be defined very easily as a page number and 
and offset. So logical addresses is used in paging and even in segmentation later. Relative address is only using in partitions, partitioning methods like fixed partitioning or um, dynamic partitioning. In this example, we can see that um, logical address is, uh, in this example, is 16-bit address. Um, we assume that we, uh, we have a page size. So that's our assumption that the page size is um, one kilobyte, which is 124 bytes to, to the power of 10 bytes. The relative address um, is, uh, in this example, is 152. In a binary format, if you convert this to a binary format, um, um, it would be 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and a 0, 3, 1, 0, 1, and then 5 zeros. So I will show you next how to translate an, uh, um, a numerical number to a binary um, um, format. But with a page size of 1 kilobyte, um, we consider that the 16 bit for the logical address uh, has 10 bits for um, the offset, uh, offset within a page. So the offset here is how far the logical address uh, um, is within each page of a process. Later on, it will be translated to offset within the main memory. And then we consider uh, six bits for the page number. So a logical address is divided into two portions. The first one is the page number and the second one is offset. We keep for this example in particular for a 16-bit address, six bits for page number and 10 bits for uh, uh, the offset. Uh, that means um, what if you can if you look here because um, the page size is um, two to the power of 10, so an offset within each page cannot exceed 10 bits. That's why the offset has been allocated to 10. So the 10 number of the offset here would actually relate it to the page size. So you always allocate the offset within a page to the page size. Uh, the relative address um, uh, is uh, if you divide the relative address, which is 1,502, into the corresponding binary representation divided into six bits, the first six bits uh, for the offset and then the next six bits for um, the page, you can see that this is page number one. Uh, keep in mind that pages for each process always start by index zero. So this will correspond to page one. And now we have an offset of 478. So this is the translation of those 10 bits into a numerical number 478 offset within page one. So this is the logical address within this process. Uh, if we would like, I will show you now how to actually um, uh, translate the logical address into physical address uh, for running and uh, running processes uh, uh, within the main memory. Uh, the same strategy is used for simple segmentation, which I'll talk about it in a um, in few more, after a few more slides, uh, in which um, the logical address is also divided into two portions. The first one is used for the offset, and the second one is used for the segment number. So for 16 uh, bit, actually, we will use, um, because we have dynamic size segments, it's different from pages. Um, pages are fixed size, like segments will be variable size. So we use uh, four bits for the segment number, and we use 12 bits for the offset. Um, is this fixed for all? Uh, examples, not necessarily. I could give you an, um, um, a logical address of 32 bits and I'll ask you to divide it based on the segment size and based uh, if you are doing segmentation or page size if you are doing paging. So if I'm going to map this uh, logical address for um, the segmentation, you can see that this is segment number one and we am having offset of 752 within the segment. So uh, if you ask yourself why, that um, we decided to use um, uh, a page size that is always power of two. Because, uh, actually, it has to, uh, this is due to main reasons. The first is the logical addressing scheme is transparent to the programmer. So the programmer is not aware about it at all, N neither the assembler, neither the linker, which means that each logical address that contains a page number and an offset of a program is identical to its relative address. 
excuse me. Second, it's relatively easy matter to implement a function in hardware to perform dynamic address translation at runtime using a page, a page size that is part of two. So in general, if we assume that um, a logical address is given as n bits and m bits combinations, where the leftmost n bits are considered um, as indicator indexing to the page numbers, and the rightmost m bits are considered as indexing for the page the offset. In this example, we use six bits for um, the page number and 10 bits for the offset. Keep in mind this 10 bits because the page size was 10, two to the power 10. So that's why we have 10. Um, so the main idea is if you would like to perform address translation between a logical address and um, a physical address, uh, what you need to actually do is to extract um, the page number as the most, uh, the leftmost n bits of the logical address. Next, you need to use the page number as index into the process page table to find the frame number. And lastly, the starting physical address of the frame will be considered as um, the frame um, number that is assigned and offset within um, the main memory which is more or less like k times to the power of m. And the physical address of the reference byte is uh, that the number plus the offset. This physical address need to be, you don't need to, um, to, to, to calculate it. It's easily constructed by just appending the frame number to the offset in the main memory. So let's actually show this by example to show the idea of uh, logical address translation. If we start by 16 bit logical address, and I would like to know exactly how to translate this into a physical address, still 16-bit physical address. Now, uh, as I said, the first step is by extracting the page number um, and uh, the leftmost n bits. Now, we, we our decision was six bits for the page number. So if we convert the address, which was 100, uh, sorry, 1,502, um, uh, into six bits for the page number. This is number one. Um, and then we have 10 uh, other um, bits considered for the offset. This is an offset of 400. So this is like the numerical number, 478. So um, if we'd like to convert this to uh, an, a physical address, so we have to keep um, uh, looking into the process table the process page table because now processes are divided into pages. And um, the second stage uh, would be um, if we now low, uh, know that we are on page one. So we're going to go immediately to page one and see which, uh, which frame has been assigned into um, page one. Keep in mind the operating system always maintain a page table in which it stores the frame number that is assigned to the page number. So frame, like in this example in particular, for this process, we know that page one is assigned to frame number six. So this is frame number six. And this is page one, number one. So now, uh, if you would like to contain um, the physical address, it's a symbol um, amendment uh, between the frame number. So we're gonna use just the frame number and the same offset from the logical address to give me uh, the physical address. So there will be uh, a new uh, physical address in the main memory for a given instruction um, that uh, has a, a logical address of uh, 1502. To summarize with simple paging, main memory is divided into many small equal size frames. Each process is divided into frame size pages Smaller processes would require fewer pages. Larger processes will require more pages. When a process is brought in, all of its pages are loaded into available frames and a page table is set up. This approach solves many of the problems inherited in the partitioning method. Now let's do another exercise of logical to address translations. 
uh, to physical address translation. Assume I have one kilobyte page size, which is two to the power of 10. Uh, what are um, the page numbers? So we are interested in the page numbers and the offset uh, of each of those uh, logical uh, addresses. And once I know it, uh, if I do have the process uh, page table, I can easily find the logical, um, uh, the physical address. But in this example in particular, I just wanna um, train you on how to uh, convert a decimal number or numerical number into a binary representation. And then from the binary representation, you will divide it into um, uh, M and N bits where the M bits uh, will be considered for um, the page number. And then for the N, actually this is N and this is M bits, considers for um, the offset. So this is the page number. And then later on, you will use the page number to index the page table. And then from the page table, you will find frame number. If we do have the page table, you're gonna use the frame number and then just amend it with the offset. Frame number goes here and the offset goes here to give you the physical or the absolute address. Let's now uh, practice uh, numerical to binary translations to obtain uh, the page number and the offset number. And we assume for the following examples that we use 16 bits um, logical address. So um, first of all, you need to uh, consider, um, it's easy to be done by a calculator, but if you're interested, you could use the lookup table where um, you start, this is uh, bit number zero, bit number one, two, three, for 16 bit, I will have a zero to 15 um, index, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 two to the power of zero. So this is two to the power of zero equals one, two to the power of one equals two, two to the power of two is equal four. So two to the power of three equals eight, and then keep going uh, because at the end, you will need to, um, to split your numerical number into multiples of those um, power of twos. Two to the power of seven, uh, an eight, and a nine, and a 10, 11, and 12, 13, 14, and 15. So now let's assume the first address uh, in the previous example, which was 200. So I do have logical address equals to 2,375. So for this, um, we need to scan the, um, the lookup table, 2,375. I do believe that I could have one bed into the port 11. So if we subtract two to the power 11, which is 2,448, that will result in three, two, seven. Keep in mind that we are using six bits so these are my six bits for the page number. And I have another 10 bits for the offset. So um, that means I do have zero over here for the page number. And then if I would like to continue assigning um, um, more ones for the offset, uh, if you'd like to actually explain it in, in more details, to the offset, you will see that the 327 uh, is one and a one and a one and a zero, zero and a zero and a one and a zero and one and a zero. So this, this is my offset of 327 in, in numerical calculations. And this is my page number two. So for this logical address, the page number is two and the offset is 327. If you're gonna do an address, let's do the next one. I'm gonna assume the next one over here is um, logical address. Equals to 
equals to 19,366. So 19,000 will have a, a number, uh, um, uh, a bit assigned to one and two to the number of uh, 14 and zero, 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 and then uh, one and a zero for the page number. So this is page number 18. And the offset will be 900, uh, one and one and a one and a zero and a one and a zero, zero, one, one, zero. So my offset over here will be 934. You could practice on subtracting um, those two to the power of 14 and two to the power of 11, if you sum them up and then subtract it from 19,366. So this is minus two to the power 14, minus two to the power of 11. They would give you 934 offset within page number 18. Now let's do a third one for logical address from the previous example that equals to 30,000. This is a numerical. If you, um, if you convert it to binary notations, that's a zero, one, one, and one, and then a zero, one, this is for the bit uh, number, which is, sorry, the page number. So this is page number 29 versus an offset, which is zero, one, zero, zero, double ones, four zeros, which is offset equals to 304. So how did you get this off, uh, offset? It's uh, um, th 30,000 uh, minus two, minus two to the power, minus two to the power 14, minus two to the power 13, minus two to the power 12, minus two to the power of 10, and then that will leave you with the 304 offset. So now we have page number 29 and offset as a logical address of uh, page um, uh, 340 within page number 29. Let's do another one for logical address equals two to 256. This is very easy. Like um, we only, uh, we don't, we have page number zero. We can have any ones are sitting, uh, sitting here. And uh, we have um, an offset that is 256. So this is zero and a one, and then nothing else, just zero. So this is a 256 offset. So address, relative address, uh, that is, logical address that is 256 is a logical address um, of page number zero and offset equals to 256. If you have lo lost one logical address, equals to 16,385. This is a uh, page number 16. So we do have zero, one, zero, 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 zero. So this is page number 16. And we have an offset of just equals to one. So this is offset equals to one. So this is minus two to the power of 14 will give you, would be exactly 16,385 minus 16,384. That's why we have offset on one. So this logical address is within uh, page 16 and it has an offset one within that page. So um, this is just an example of how to convert a numerical number to uh, a logical address. And then uh, that is a split between a page number and an offset. You're gonna use this later for address translation between a logical address to a physical address. As we talk now about simple segmentation, um, paging, let's now talk about the simple segmentation. A user program can actually be subdivided using segmentation. 
in which the program and its associated data are divided into a number of segments. It is not required that all segments of the program to be of the same length, although there is a maximum segment length. As with paging, also a logical address using uh, segmentation would consist of two parts. The first one will be uh, segment number and offset. Because of the use of unequal segment uh, lengths, segmentation is similar to dynamic partitioning, but keep in mind whether it's segmentation or paging, the process is divided uh, similarly to um, uh, the same fashion as the main memory, which is different from partitioning uh, method. Uh, the partitioning memory management method, if well, like equal or unequal size or fixed or dynamic size, in which the memory is only partitioned for paging and segmentation, the memory is partitioned and the process is partitioned. In the absence of an overlay scheme or the use of virtual memory, it would be required that all of a program segments to be loaded into memory for execution. The difference compared to dynamic partitioning is that the segmentation um, uh, with the segmentation, a program may occupy more than one partition, and these partitions um, need, uh, like, they don't have to be in sequence. Uh, segmentations actually eliminate internal fragmentation, but like dynamic partitioning, it suffers from external fragmentation. Um, however, because a process is broken up into a number of smaller pieces, the amount of external fragmentation should uh, be less. Um, as we have seen before, paging is invisible to the programmer. It is completely done as a collaboration between the operating system and the processor. On the other hand, segmentation is always visible to the programmer and is provided as a convenience way um, uh, for organizing programs and data. Typically, the programmer or a compiler even will assign programs and data for different segments. For purposes of module or modular programming, the, the program or data may be further broken down into multiple segments. The principle in, uh, this principle is actually an uh, inconvenience um, uh, of this surface. Um, that is, the programmer must be aware of the maximum segment size uh, limitation. So the programmer actually uh, is considered as um, a monitor that would decide on uh, the segment's uh, variable sizes. And uh, this is um, what we don't normally like about segmentation, like um, more or less like the inconvenience principle about it. Uh, but it still uh, gives more flexibility um, to define different frequent sizes that will help in um, reducing the amount of uh, external fragmentations. Another consequence of unequal size segments is that there is no simple relationship between logical address and physical address. Uh, analog to, uh, if you like, um, if you can compare this to um, an analog fashion to paging, a simple segmentation scheme would make uh, use of a segment table for each process uh, and the list of free blocks of main memory, uh, such that each uh, segment table entry uh, would have to give the starting address in the main memory of the corresponding segment. The entry should also provide the length of the segment to assure that invalid addresses are not used. When a process enters the running state, the address of its segment table is loaded into a special register used by the memory management hardware. Um, now consider that um, if we have an address similar to what we have done for um, paging, if we do have a logical address that has n and n bits, the leftmost n bits are considered as the segment number and the rightmost n bits are considered as offset within the segment. In our example here, uh, we, if we assume that later on we have, um, actually in the previous example, uh, we used four for the segment number and 12 for the offset. Uh, if we have, um, if we assume 12 for offset and four for segment, 
So that means um, the maximum segment size would be two to the power 12, which is 4,096 bytes. So what are the main steps that you need to do to do logical address to physical address translation if you are using segmentation as a way of memory management? The first thing you need to do is to extract the segment number as the leftmost end bits of the logical address, and then use the segment number as an index into the process segment table. So we do have a process segment table similar to the page segment table in which we are storing also um, frames assigned to segments and um, um, the, um, uh, sorry, we, we, we store at the length of the segment and the starting address of a segment. Um, and then when you use the segment number as index to the process segment table, we're gonna find um, the physical address of the segment. And then we're gonna compare the offset expressed in the rightmost end bits to the length of the segment. If the offset is greater than or even equal to the length, then this address is valid. Um, if not, then an interrupter will be generated that we are dealing with invalid address. And if it's a valid address, then the desired physical address uh, is generated as the sum of the starting physical address of the segment plus the offset. Let's see how this actually done. In our example here, we have 16-bit logical address. Um, we assume that we are using four bits for segment and 12 bits for offset. Um, with, uh, with this address assignment, like uh, we do have segment number one and we have an offset of, if you're gonna do like um, number uh, binary to numerical translation, this is an offset of 752 within a segment, within segment number one. Now suppose that this segment is residing in the main memory uh, starting at physical address that is a combination of um, the base address plus the offset. But uh, how did we came up with the base address? These are the information stored in the process uh, segment table. So in the process segment table for each segment, we store two things, the length of the segment and the starting address of the segment, which we call it the base address. This is different from the page table and the page table where we're restoring the page, uh, the frame number and uh, that's it. Uh, so we were amending the frame number to the offset and we got a uh, uh, physical address. In segmentation, it's different. For each entry in the segment table, the process segment table, we store information, the operating system is responsible of storing information about the length of the segment, which was determined by the programmer, as well as the starting address uh, of each segment, which is stored in the base. Now with the assumption that you were able to split the logical address into segment uh, bits for segment number, as well as bits for the offset, what you're gonna do next is you're gonna take the value from the base, which is the starting address, and now we're doing addition. That's not amending. Um, that's not like uh, you append um, the offset to the frame number. This is actual addition. You're going to use an adder for this. So you're going to add um, the uh, offset to um, the um, page address. So we're going to add 0, 0, 1, 0, 4 ones, and then four zeros to 0, 0, 1, 0. I hope like let's do zero, zero, zero. So I don't miss any zeros here and zero and one, and then zeros everywhere. So if we add these up, we will get the following physical address. So with this physical address, what we observe is, um, what we are observing is, uh, or what we, are, what, we have to, what we have to test is, if the physical address here is within the length of the segment, so that's fine. So no, uh, no, um, no interrupt will be generated. If this physical address is beyond the segment um, length, then an interrupt will be generated saying like invalid address. So um, this is an example of show, to show how the logical address to physical address translation is done in segmentation. And uh, most importantly is 
um, with simple segmentation, a process is divided into a number of segments that not necessarily to be of equal size and not necessarily to be loaded in the same, uh, in the same sequence in the main memory. When a process is prod n, all of its segments are loaded into variable regions of memory. And of course, a segment table is set up that, uh, is, uh, uh, that contains the length of each segment and the starting address of each segment. And um, um, the segment table is used to guarantee that we have a logical address um, to physical address translation. So um, I just need to revise the base. I think like for the base address, maybe I don't have the matching bits, but the idea is like, I don't want to confuse you with those number. Just add the value in the base plus the value of the offset. Just add them up to come up with the value of the um, physical address. So if I'm going to add the offset, the offset is um, just 12 bits and the base address, the base is 16 bits. So a zero, five zeros and a one, that's the base address, two, three, one and a zero, zero. And then we're going to add the offset, zero, 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 and then one, and then another one and four ones, three and four, and then zero, one, zero, zero, and then the rest is zeros. So if you add this up, it will give you, this is the correct one, it give you this address at the end, right? So um, this is how segmentation is performed. So in summarization, in, in the first part of today's class, we talked about uh, different ways of addressing the problems of fixed partitioning, dynamic partitioning by using different um, placement algorithms in the body system. We talked about the importance of relocation and the mapping between relative address to a physical address or a logical address uh, to a physical address, whether it's in simple paging and um, simple segmentation. I will stop here and I will start the second part.